Welcome, everybody, to His and Hers. Now, those of you that rock with us every day know we just usually get right to it, but not today. Today is a special day for two reasons. One, Mike Greenberg making His and Hers history. My guest co-host couldn't be happier to have you. And number two, today's your 20th anniversary. Your career here at ESPN has gone 20 years. It's almost of drinking age. Uh, almost, exactly <laughs> right. I, and, and it has driven me to drink over the course of many years. But it is a delight to be here because I'm one of those who rocks with you on this show most days. But you only rock with us for 33 minutes. Um, no, I only work out for 33 <laughs> minutes. But I have my cool down. I, have, I usually am rocking with you for more than 33 minutes. Okay, well, you do know you have to do this entire hour, right? Uh, well, listen, I have not been contractually obligated to that yet. Yeah, let's do 33 minutes and see how it goes. Okay, let's do that. Well, let's jump right into it and talk about the Cowboys. That didn't take long. Panic in the streets of Dallas because Tony Romo took an awkward hit to his surgically repaired back. The Cowboys are considering whether Romo will undergo an MRI, but Romo himself admitted that hit was a little bit scary. Yeah, I feel fine. You know, it just obviously was a jolt to the back, and, you know, it was kind of a perfect storm for a perfect hit. I mean, initially, your, your back is, like, in protection mode, so it kind of locks up for a second. It's like, okay, yeah, it's, I'm okay. Well, I was holding my breath, too, so I think we all did it together. But, you know, more than anything, I really feel like that was probably about as bad a shot as I've taken in my back. It looked bad, that's for sure. How scared should Cowboys fans be about losing him? Well, first off, just the remarkable athleticism of football players. He got folded like an accordion. The fact that he got up and moved at all is remarkable, and it doesn't sound like it's a serious injury. But on the subject of how concerned they should be about him getting hurt in general on a scale of one to ten i'm going to go lower than you might expect i'm going to go five really and here's the reason why because the future is sitting on your bench and your present isn't as good as you think it is the dallas cowboys may have the worst defense in the national football league and as a consequence while i know there are a lot of people thinking super thoughts in dallas i'm not one of them i don't believe this is a super bowl caliber team based on their defensive deficiency regardless so i'm not saying in any way they're better off in the short term with Dak Prescott or anybody else than Tony Romo, who I think is a great player. But I don't think what you're losing if you lose Romo is a Super Bowl championship this year one way or the other. Yeah, because a lot of this is built on expectations. And while I certainly don't think they're Super Bowl caliber, they do seem like a team that could make the playoffs. But nevertheless, we've just seen it too many times uh, or enough times with Tony Romo getting hurt, getting dinged up here and there. And as you mentioned, it's not like he's getting any younger. His window to play at that position is shortening, it seems, uh, by the minute. And their seasons have been derailed by injuries to him and to Dez Bryant. And so I know if you're a Cowboys fan and you see that Romo clutching his back uh, the, with the issues and history he has there, how could you not be afraid? Now maybe, and we'll talk about Dak Prescott in a moment, now maybe you're a little less uh, fearful because you know there seems to be at least a plant uh, heir apparent that might be there. So maybe you're a little less scared. But I, I'm still concerned because it feels like the Tony Romo, Dez Bryant, uh, partnership that it's never been able to truly maximize because injuries have beset both of them. It maximized itself for one season yep. in which they, I think they should have won the Super Bowl. I will go to my grave believing Des Bryant caught that ball at Lambeau Field. I think they would have beaten Seattle the next week and I think they would have won the championship that they deserved. Their defense played way above its head that year, two years ago. Last year was a wash, as you mentioned, because of the injuries. This year I think their defense takes a step back. They're all suspended, they're all hurt, and the real Really good player they have coming with the cavalry the kid from Notre Dame the linebacker isn't coming until next year so yes I mean in a macro sense I think that this is not as big an issue because I don't think they're a championship team on a micro sense it's a disaster because no matter how good Dak Prescott winds up being he's still going to be a rookie quarterback this year so if the threshold is the playoffs this is a disaster. If the yeah. threshold is a championship, I don't think it's that. Okay, since we brought up Dak, uh, Dak Prescott, let's talk about him. He's been killing it in, in the preseason, had a passer rating that just was stupid in the last, uh, not this past preseason game, but the one before that. I mean, is he as good as he looks, or are we just making too much of this because it's preseason? No one is as good as he looks so far <laughs> through right. these three weeks. But I am starting to get a sense that this is not just the all-August team, as Herman Edwards called it, but it's something more than that. And look, I'm just a fan. I'm not basing that on any brilliant analysis, but I'm listening. So I'm listening to what personnel people around the league are saying. I'm listening to what coaches around the league are saying. I'm listening to what our analysts here at ESPN are saying. 
And they are suggesting that he is so far ahead of where you would expect a quarterback at his stage of development to be. That, to me, is an enormous sign. He obviously has all the tangibles. If he has the intangibles as well, then he looks like they may have just struck gold in the fourth round. And I would say this as well, that while I'm not a scout, you can just tell sometimes when someone jumps off the screen. This guy jumps off the screen. If there is an it factor that you can have as a football player, he seems to have it. So, I mean, could it all be a mirage? Of course it could. But I'm starting to get a feeling that it's not. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the it factor. That's exactly how Des Bryant described it, is that he just has it. And I think most of us know it when you see it. Now, I'm not ready to fit him for a Hall of Fame jacket exactly yet. But to me, the preseason is just a test. It's just the, the first of many exams he'll get. And right now, he's passed that with flying colors. Because let's be realistic, it's a lot of rookie quarterbacks that start preseason games, and they don't look like that. So it does mean something. It may not mean everything, but it definitely means something. Well, look, I mean, for whatever it's worth, there are rookie quarterbacks that teams mortgage their entire lives for to trade up to the number one pick like they did with the Rams, and Jared Goff has fallen to third on the depth chart. That doesn't mean he won't eventually right. be a great quarterback, but it means whatever it means. Look, all of us are just guessing at this point. Um, Prescott has a couple of advantages working in his favor. He has a great offensive line. He has really good talent at the skill positions. All the things that Tony Romo has at his, um, at his beck and call as well. So my gut feeling is that Prescott is the heir apparent and that that is a year or two away and not more than that for all the reasons mm -hmm. that you just described. They may have fallen into something spectacular here. It could turn out to be nothing, but again, if I were betting on it right now, I would bet that he is the real deal. Let's, let's talk about another Cowboy young player. Uh, while the Cowboy fans were momentarily depressed about seeing Rumble go down, I'm sure Ezekiel Elliott kind of lifted their spirits. Yeah, it was just preseason, but one of the biggest locks for the upcoming NFL season is that this guy is going to be pretty fantastic. Pretty impressed that he was putting some licks on people, especially Cam Chancellor. Elliot said afterward, normally I don't talk, but they were being chippy, man, and I'm not soft. So what, we looking at the next Emmitt Smith? What are well, we doing here? Listen, I said leading up to this, once again, I'm not, I'm not a draft analyst, but to my eye, watching college football, he was the best player in college football last year. Everyone was talking about Leonard Fournette, who's a terrific running back and a terrific player, and other guys. To me, Ezekiel Elliott was the best player in college football last year, and his skill set translates exactly to what they're doing in the National Football League. He is a more dynamic athlete than Emmitt Smith was. Mm -hmm. Now, what we will never know, and, and maybe no one will be, Emmitt Smith was the toughest running back I ever saw play. Mm -hmm. With the possible exception of Walter Payton, you may have to go back to Jim Brown, which is before for both of our times for a running back as tough as Emmett Smith was. That's what made him special. And look, through one preseason game, I mean, he smashed into Cam Chancellor and yeah. Cam Chancellor was impressed. Um, so if he's got the toughness, look, I mean, these, no one is ever going to run for as many yards as Emmett Smith ever again. That record will stand forever because of the way the game is played. But Elliott is the running back of the National Football League in 2016. He is a lock to be Rookie of the Year. You, you, uh, that's what I love about you, Greeny. You're such a TV professional. I was being facetious, but you answered the question any damn way. Hey, hun, I, I, I believe I he is the next in the line. I go back to Dorsett, who was obviously a great player, and then Emmett, who was a great player, and now they've got Ezekiel Elliott, and I think he is he absolutely has the ability, if he stays healthy, to be a guy we talk about in exactly the same context. Much to your point about Cam Chancellor, he said, the second time, you know I'm bringing that wood, talking about the second, if they see them again. I was a little surprised the first time, but he's got a lot of courage for that. I'll give it to him. But if it was a full game, it would have been a bloodbath. Well, that's the thing that Ezekiel Elliott needs to learn, is don't run into guys like Cam Chancellor. Run around them, oh, run away I, from I them. I can't get, I can't support You don't that. want to get these guys hurt. Look, I made this point in a different context today, right? Andy Dalton, they've instructed him in Cincinnati not to tackle guys after he throws interceptions. I know how you feel about this. That's issue. genius. It's brilliant. They should have a helicopter hovering over the field. When these quarterbacks throw interceptions, they should have a rope ladder that comes down like Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible, and they should just hoist them out of harm's way. These guys are too valuable for any one play to take their seasons away, and I would say the you same of Zeke tell Elliott. A running back that I love running backs. Most, one of the reasons I love Adrian Peterson, they go looking to deliver pain. And if you're a veteran on that team and you saw him take on one of the best hitters in the NFL, you ought to be celebrating this. That means that kid has heart, that he's not afraid of anybody. I'll rock with that kind of player any day. Yes, but I'd like to rock with him into two or three contracts. <laughs> 
quarterbacks, if I'm him, <laughs> and certainly I'd like to still have him being able to run when he's 30, and it's one of the reasons most of these guys can't. Yeah, well, if he takes too many of those kind of hits or goes to seek that kind of content, maybe he'll be looking for some medicinal help. Speaking of taking hits. <laughs> right? Uh, quickly becoming a bigger story than what Ezekiel Elliott did on the field is how he spent his dime, downtime before the game. It's caught on video here at a marijuana dispensary in Seattle. He wasn't shown buying any of the merchandise. It's just a casual little stroll. Jerry Jones, though, he was not happy, saying it's not good. It's just not good. It's just not good. I think this was a bad look for Ezekiel Elliott. I do, and it shouldn't be. I mean, at the end of the day, this is something that there shouldn't be any problem with whatsoever, and there shouldn't be the stigma attached to it that there is, but there is. We talked about this at length this morning on my show with Booger McFarland, who mm -hmm. played nine years in the NFL and disagrees with me, and I respect his perspective on it. Look, where he was in the state of Washington and where I spend many of my vacations in the state of Colorado, this is perfectly legal, and there are these stores where they are selling it like you might walk into any other store and buy you know, yourself a soda or something like that. I will admit that when I was in Colorado last, I sent you a picture from outside of one of them. Um, but I was very curious to see what it's like inside one of them. And I didn't go in for exactly this reason. Because I'm concerned that someone will see me in there and take a picture. And the next thing you know, I have to explain why I'm in one of these stores. Even though there is nothing at all illegal about, nor should there be anything wrong with, being in these stores. That said, Zeke Elliott, with the things that are going on around him right now and the position that he's in, he probably, not probably, he shouldn't have been there. And I'm sure many people have told him that today. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the optics of something just aren't good. And I know that I don't want to, certainly don't want to put on the white wig and act like I'm judging him. Because like you, if I were in either of those places, I would be curious and want to go in there. I might risk it. I don't know, just to see what it looked like. Because I've never been inside a marijuana uh, dispensary. But for him, as you mentioned, with all the other stuff uh, that's happened, being a young player in this league, really, being a rookie, representing the team he's representing, anytime they breathe, it's a headline. You're setting yourself up uh, to be perceived negatively, even though I agree with you that you shouldn't. And look, here's the reality is that my opinion uh, of marijuana usage and football players in general has evolved tremendously, almost like uh, my opinion on uh, performance enhancing drugs. At some point, the NFL overall is just going to have to get with the times and realize as a country, it's moving very uh, hastily toward uh, legalization and you have a lot of guys that are sitting out of games in these suspensions and while I realize to a large degree that's a common sense test you know you're gonna get tested all, just don't smoke it's just times of the year you just can't smoke right. all right you, you just gotta figure that one out right so but in, in overall in general they're gonna have to move to that point where they have to take marijuana uh, off the table I believe that too and I, I don't know how close they are getting to that but it feels like it's moving in that direction well, at least amongst the players. Look, I think that there is an argument to be made right now that the damage these guys may be doing to themselves long term by taking some of the prescription pain medication that NFL teams not only allow but give to them is actually more damaging in the long run than, than using marijuana, which may not have almost any significant health ramifications. Having said that, much as I say frequently when it comes to the issues of amateurism in the NCAA, I don't agree with the rules, but I cannot suggest people break them. Which is to say, if you don't think the rule makes sense, then let's try and do something about that. Let's have this conversation about changing the marijuana rule in the, in the National Football League. While it is what it is, you have to live with it. That is the price of admission to being an NFL player. Zeke Elliott knows that. If he didn't know it yesterday, he certainly knows it today. Yeah, he may have gotten the attention of the NFL by just being there. So that's also uh, some heat I'm sure that he doesn't want. Want. All right, staying in the NFL. So this Joey Bosa situation just continues to perplex me. The Chargers announced in a statement they've pulled their latest contract offer to Bosa, and they made sure to shade him thoroughly in the process and drop the bombshell that even, even if he did sign today, he wouldn't play a full season because it hasn't had enough time to prep. Meanwhile, his agent kind of fired back at the Chargers, and basically, we've got a situation on our hands. For the life of me, I can't understand why. Supposedly, the sides have sort of come together on him getting 85% of his bonus, but yet it's still a stalemate. Um, should, at this point, considering the team has agreed, 85% of, of your signing bonus will give you that. 
Should Joey Bosa just say, forget it, just wave the white flag? Yes, he should, and that makes me furious because he is 100% in the right. The bottom line of it is this. The precedent that is significant here is not what the Chargers have ever done in the past. It's what all the other teams right. in the NFL have done. No player drafted in the position that he has been drafted in by the Chargers has ever been faced with the specific circumstances they're trying to put on him. And as you just tried to point out, it's not interesting enough to get into the details right. of what they are. The point of it is, in my opinion, he's 100 100% right. They're 100% wrong. But this is $17 million. He will never get back if he leaves it on the table. He is in no way guaranteed to be drafted that high again next year if he sits out the season and, and goes back into the draft. And the person who is sitting back right now, like Kermit the Frog drinking a cup of tea, is Archie Manning saying, I told <laughs> this you. Is why. This is why. This is why I didn't want Eli going out to San Diego. And LaDainian Tomlinson feels that way. And Phillip Rivers and all those guys know it. The Chargers don't do business the way the other 31 teams in the NFL do it. That said, that's the war. This is a battle. And, and at the end of the day, Joey Bosa needs to get his money. He needs to sign. Well, he does. But there's a part of me. I mean, I, I've, I've thought about this. Like, if you're Joey Bosa, how good, even once you do sign this contract, eventually, assuming that's the case, how good do you feel? about playing for this organization no maybe not that good but let me ask you a question if i gave you this piece of paper and said sign it and i'll give you 17 million dollars <laughs> would you sign it well yes i would I too and that's at the end of the day that's the crux of the decision he has to make he has to decide he can't just say i'm going somewhere else that's not an option for another year so his options are you have to live within the confines of your reality his reality is sign with the chargers bite the bullet hopefully figure out some way to smooth over whatever's happened or sit out the season go back into the draft next year roll the dice on that and never make back the money that you lose out on this season that is the lesser of two options well yeah i mean the money look, look I, i've never had seventeen and a half million dollars before me so i i don't understand what that's like and so it's easy for me to sit back and say this but at the but there is some part of me that wonders like you have to feel good about who you're going to be putting that uniform on for the next few years and i wondered in his mind, even if you do sign and all that lingers and you don't feel good about it, is it worth it just from a peace of mind standpoint to re-enter yourself in the draft? Yes, you're right. You may lose the money, but if you have the peace of mind, and let's not act like he's going to be poor if he re-enters the draft, it might actually be worth it to, pay with a or to play for an organization that doesn't do this kind of stuff. Maybe it would be for you. I can honestly admit it would not be for me. I've said many <laughs> times I have integrity, but I also have two kids to put through college, and that's the first priority. And in my, if I were in his position, I would hold my nose and I would sign the contract. All right. See, that's, that, that's why you've lasted 20 years. That's exactly right. right. I've right. held my nose for many years <laughs> sitting next to Mike Cole. All right. I'm going to try Mike Greenberg tees here. Uh, coming up next on His and Hers, we'll discuss the most important conversation we've ever had at this network. Took place last night in Chicago. A lot of good stuff, though. His and Hers is brought to you by Firehouse Subs, the hero of all subs. Sully, the untold story behind the miracle on the Hudson, in theaters September 9th. And Dawn, a drop of Dawn and Grease's go. You would come up to me and I would have a big bulge in my pocket. It looked like a wallet. And it was a 380 handgun. And what it was, unfortunately for me, was an invitation to disaster. It changed my entire mental dynamic. I'm sitting at a red light one night, two in the morning, just waiting to, the light to change, and I saw a guy crossing the street. Typical me, I'm just looking at the guy normal, before the gun. All right, this guy just crossed the street. But with the gun in my pocket, my first question is, what does he want? See how that changed that quick? Mm -hmm. and, and then the guy stops, takes a look at my car, and starts to double back to come to the side of the vehicle. Now, without the gun, I'm like, who's this dude? Is he lost? Does he need help? But with the gun, all of a sudden it's out my pocket. All of a sudden I'm looking at him in a different mental exchange and thinking of a different altercation and a different outcome. And when the guy taps on my window and I'm sitting there with a loaded gun pointed at him and all I do is roll down the window, what's going on? And he says, can you tell me where Home Street is? Right. Diffused me, disarmed me, and made me realize I was going to hurt someone in my likeness. I was going to hurt someone in my image. I was going to hurt someone in my family, as all the stats show and prove, before I was ever going to protect myself from an outsider, from a stranger.
right, that was Marcellus Wiley, one of many powerful panelists that we had last night on the Undefeated Town Hall on athletes' responsibility and violence. And Greeny, it was I was obviously in a different position because I was moderating, um, but there were so many different and powerful takeaways. Uh, that I had from the conversation, 90 minutes. Uh, it was a lot there, a lot to digest. And mostly uh, for me, uh, just hearing everybody's story and getting to talk to some of the residents uh, in the, who, were, who live in Chicago, who were there uh, just watching in the audience, is that we were able to have a conversation about gun violence and particularly gun violence in the African-American community without, I felt like, doing a disservice uh, to another issue that's got a lot of attention in this country in police brutality. Because a lot of times what happens is when there's discussion about the tension between African-Americans and the police, you hear some, uh, you know, some people in the crowd from way over here say, well, what about, quote, black on black crime? You guys have so much violence in your own community. Why aren't you more concerned about that? And that was a great opportunity and example that the people in Chicago do care. It's everybody else that doesn't care. And that's why they're still remaining in the deadly situation that they are. And uh, we talked a lot about that, is that this has got to be seen as more than just a Chicago problem. And more than just Chicago, people have to be interested in fixing it. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, Chicago is my second home. I lived there for 11 years. I met and married my wife there. I love it. I feel that I'm home there and I hate my response to this but what I would say is there is a helplessness that I feel with regard to this topic particularly the epidemic of gun violence in this country that is unlike a help any feeling that I have about anything else which is to say with almost anything and look I so admire the courage and the leadership of guys like LeBron and Melo and all of them and the athletes and everyone else involved who is trying to make a difference trying to make a dent in this crisis that we have but with almost anything else, I can think of what the first step is towards solving a problem. And in all candor, I don't know, if you came to me and said, Greeny, what is the first thing we need to do to start, start solving the problem of, of, of gun, rampant gun violence in the major cities of this country? My honest answer is, I don't know. And that is a very helpless way to feel. So I would like to ask you, um, because I respect your voice in this as much as anyone's, and because your role last night was to ask the questions and not to answer them, what is the answer to that question? What is the very first tangible step that we as a people, we as a society, as a nation, can take towards trying to solve the, the problem of gun violence? Okay, we've created the conversation, and it's not a new conversation. Marcellus talked about this last night. I remember when I was growing up, uh, I'm a Detroit native, as you know, and what's happening in Chicago was Detroit's story my entire life. They were the murder capital pretty much my entire childhood, Detroit was, and they're still uh, on that list, probably in the top ten, and, and Flint as well, and in, in the top five. And the problem is always, it's not the, the people. The people care. It's the policy makers. See, it's, it's unfortunately become good business to subjugate and impoverish people. And as long as that remains good business, then we see what we see. There's a lot of policy things that have happened that have created these situations in cities like Chicago and Milwaukee and Detroit, fair housing practices, uh, the f redlining, uh, just a number of issues. And because it doesn't come from the top down, that's why you do feel that helplessness, because we can sit here and talk and discuss all, everything that we want to, but until the people who make the decisions, and for that matter, uh, allocate the resources, until they care about changing it, changing it nothing's going to get done. And unfortunately, we're talking about a segment of people where it's very easy to dismiss and to overlook. I mean, the way, and one of the reasons why I hate that phrase, black on black crime, is because it's really neighborhood crime. Most people in this country who are killed, you're killed by somebody you know. You're killed by somebody who's usually in your same racial demographic. That's just the reality of crime. But I hate the phrase because it suggests that somehow African Americans are more prone to violence, that this is something that we just do. And so that is also why I think you have people who have a certain amount of apathy when it comes to crime in those communities. It's real easy to not care about poor black and brown people. Very easy, too easy in this country. And so I applaud uh, LeBron and all those guys for really sparking something. There's a lot of athletes that, we're do that are doing things that we have no idea about. And I want to point to something Michael Wilbon said last night, and I know we have the sound up, but I'll just set it up this way. He helped me, uh, he helped me loosen my perspective on the issues of athletes and what their responsibility uh, is in this issue. So hopefully we can play that right now.
I don't want to keep score anymore. I don't want to keep scoring who's doing what, who's not doing enough. We got people uh, enough on the ground. I, I look at, I want to commend him. I know he hasn't been on the panel yet. But Rajon Rondo just got, just signed with the, with the Bulls recently, right? And, 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 and I've gotten any number of phone calls. I'm sure you've got them too. Yeah, yeah. About yeah. like Rondo hit the ground, like he just parachuted in and immediately involved himself in a community which he is not emotionally connected. Just did it. And I, I, the first thing, I, when I came here today, I wanted to see him to thank him for that. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of dovetailing with Isaiah's point. There are enough people doing enough strong, involved things where let's, we, I think we can ride those people. I'm not worried about who's not, you know, in, in this whole keeping score situation. He's not doing enough. He should have said this 20 years ago. That's, that's, a, that's a waste of our time. And he's right, because uh, I think we do spend a lot of time, especially with athletes, talking about the people who aren't at the table. Let's talk about all the people that are, and maybe that's where we should focus our attention. And look, the, the people who aren't at the table, obviously, they just choose not to be. I mean, recently, with Michael Jordan, when he came out with his statement uh, about violence, and we heard about his donations both to the NAAC Legal Defense uh, Fund and a community policing organization, we spent a lot of time talking about what he hadn't done for 20 years. Right. And people didn't even know how to accept the gesture. And I think Will Bond is right, and I'm at that point where I'm just kind of over that. Like we. we if they don't want to be involved, I'm not going to beg you. But the people that are involved, I want to support what they're doing and call attention and, and have commentary on that. I agree with you completely. Once again, I, the first thing I said was I admire the courage and the leadership of the people who are willing to take the stand. But I think to your previous point, these problems are so systemic, they are so ingrained, and they are really being created by people who they are not affecting. The people who are being affected by the problems are not the ones who have the ability to change it, at least not for the most part. Maybe on a small level, on one street at a time level, and that's wonderful. You can only attack a problem, I guess, one street at a time. But until you have someone who actually has impact over all the streets at once that invests him or herself into this problem, then I think change is going to be painfully slow. And unfortunately, when we see the, 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 the terrible incidents that continue to take place, they get so much attention that sometimes it feels like whatever progress you are making is almost being undermined and brought back to before to making it worse than it was when it started. So uh, th I would go back to what I was saying. I admire everyone who is, who is doing what they can, and certainly I would like to lend my voice in any way that I can, but there is a helplessness that I feel with regard, as I just sit and read the newspaper every single day, that I can't remember ever feeling about any other issue in my entire life. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of staggering uh, when you think about it in, in the macro level, but I think they're just bit by bit. Uh, people have to do what they can in the no, way that's a good can. point and actually that actually then I'm glad I asked you that question because that actually is the answer to the question the answer I guess sometimes is you just have to do what you can if you can't solve all of the problems then solve one and and that that's actually the best answer I've had yeah. today and I think a lot of these athletes they know the best thing they can offer is presence yeah and so they get that especially with uh, being role models and impacting young people all right coming up uh, Royals outfielder or rather, this is this is what we call heart in the pain. I think you know about this. Yeah, yeah. Jared Dyson, that might have been the catch of the year, but we're going to go harder in the pain. The greatest heart in the pain of all time.